Lauren Hill is an inspiration. Lauren Hill is my hero. She has a mind of a, like an 80-year-old woman. Lauren is one of the most unique artists in the history of hip hop. But life is, is, is continued work toward bettering ourselves and bettering the lives of others around us. Not only to the world of hip hop, She's an inspiration to everybody. First met Lauren when we did Sister Act 2. And I thought she was quite a, an interesting young lady. So whenever you stand for something, and you stand for goodness and truth, you will always get resistance. That's period. This is, of course, before I heard her sing. And she opened her mouth and all my hair fell out. She's everything. I want to let uh, young people know it is not a burden to love him and to represent him and to be who you are. And the best new artist is... The best rap album is... And the album of the year goes to... Ladies and gentlemen, Lauryn Hill. August 25th, 1998. This week, our next guest received the most Grammy nominations of any female recording artist ever. One of the biggest selling female artists of 1998. I couldn't be happier to have her here. This is her brilliant CD, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. A year after the Fuji's breakup and her first child's birth, Lauren Noel Hill released her highly anticipated album, widely regarded as a seminal work, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. The album marked a revolutionary milestone in the history of music, reshaping the narrative of hip hop with its groundbreaking fusion of soul, RB, and reggae. The virtuistic blend of soul-stirring vocals, transcendent conventional genre boundaries, put them all becoming a catalyst for empowering women, not only in the industry, but all over the world, challenging norms and asserting their undeniable influence. I had a lot of things that I wanted to say, and at that period of time in, in, in like R&B music, there weren't really many people who were like saying anything, you know, saying certain things in their lyrics, and I, I, and I wanted to... You know, I wanted to make sure that I had something to say, you know, and I wanted to make sure that, that it reached the people. The album's lyrical depth explores the themes of love, heartbreak, and the struggles of balancing personal and professional life while simultaneously confronting social issues such as racial inequality and the impact of systematic oppression. You know, it was about a young woman, you know, in the music industry. Uh, you know, and the pitfalls, the snares, the traps, and they don't stop, they keep coming. You know, they don't stop. I think that because I, I grew up in such a loving family structure, I thought that everybody did. And therefore, I thought that everybody reaped the, the benefit of that love. And pretty naive way to think. And so I learned very important lessons about people and their voids. The miseducation of Lauren Hill since the day of its release became a worldwide phenomenon, with many considering to be one of the best hip-hop albums of all time, and not just for being a musical masterpiece, but a powerful vessel for thought-provoking social discourse. While the album swiftly achieved worldwide success, solidifying its status as a landmark in hip-hop, the journey leading up to it, as well as the subsequent path, was marked by undeniable bumps and challenges. After more than 25 years, The Miseducation remains the only solo studio album released by Lauryn Hill. Despite its accolades, the reasoning behind her early self-imposed exile from the music industry has always been in question, and before securing numerous awards and adopting the title Empress of Hip Hop, the beginning for Miss Hill wasn't easy. She was a superstar. Two months before getting on stage, the Fujis released their soon-to-be infamous album, The Score. It quickly became one of the biggest hits of 1996, selling an unbelievable 11 million copies and securing a spot as one of the best-selling hip-hop albums of all time. Much of the album's success contributed to their cover versions of old favorites such as No Woman No Cry by Bob Marley and the Wailers and Killing Me Softly with His Song, originally recorded by Laurie Lieberman. The lyrics, the music, everything was just perfect. While the three were all seen as one unit, it's hard to understate the attention that Miss Hill garnered not only from the media, but also from the fans, and it doesn't take a genius to understand why. Young, smart, beautiful, talented, those are just a few of many accolades that we could use to describe Miss Hill, but in my opinion, the most important factor to many was her pursuit of being independent. 
been quoted frequently about your views on um, the lack of opportunities for women in the music industry. What do you think we can do to change that in the future? I think it is changing. I just I hope that it's not a trend. You know what I mean? I hope it's not like disco music and then a couple of years later to be out of style and no women will be able to do what they're doing. Um, you know, it's it's it's... It's, it's a challenge just because for some reason um, people always think that behind some woman there's some male toy master or manipulator who's telling her what to say and what to think and um, also women aren't supposed to know what's best for them you know um, but adversity doesn't scare me. The Fujis won two Grammy Awards in 1997, one for the best rap album and second for the best R&B vocal performance by a duo or group for their song Killing Me Softly. We like to thank God for teaching us how important it is to be humble, especially in this business. Thank you for everybody, everybody who supported us, the refugees make music for all people. By the beginning of 1997, the group was a household name, with many speculating about what would be their next move. With a lot of eyes being pointed toward the only female in the group, fans were starting to stir up a conversation about Lauren Hill and the possibility of her releasing a solo album. A team plays the game baseball and and when they play they play to win <laughs> but they play as a team so when we did the album we did it as a team well the wait for their next move didn't last long while the trio at the beginning of the year appeared next to each other on a couple of songs by the middle of it they announced their breakup these news shook the hip-hop fans to their core how did the group which only a little over a year ago managed to release an album that would stun everyone and become one of the biggest success stories in hip-hop history, put it all behind them and just simply leave, going their separate ways, with even the bigger question being, why? What happened? If the group has broken up, I don't know about it yet, so maybe somebody should call me and <laughs> let me know, but um, I, I, I would like to, I don't, want to think that you know what I mean because I think that as a collective unit you know there was a lot of strength there but we all we've always been a strong unit and we've also been strong individual personality at the time one of the explanations was that the group members and more specifically Lauren Hill wanted to be more independent and have full creative freedom which in turn caused friction between the members if I'd had it my way I would have been in the group forever you know I enjoyed the group atmosphere I thought you know, it's so good to have two guys on stage backing you up. But um, the interesting thing about entertainment is that when you're struggling, everybody goes in with the same goals. You know, but somewhere along the success area, you start to look at everyone around you and go, wait a minute, where are you going? Where are you headed? Because I'm going this way. Wait, what happened? I thought we were all on the, you know, and um, Sometimes success can do that. Sometimes it, it really uh, illuminates, you know, creative differences, spiritual differences, you know, um, emotional differences. It, it, it's really interesting because I didn't actually make a decision to be solo. It really just happened. I, I promise you that it's hard to explain, but, you know, I'd intended to be in the group forever until I found myself in, in circumstances where I felt the, the inner desire to express myself freely and openly without any constraint, you know, without anybody saying, hey, that's, you can't say that. That's not, that's not fly, you can't say that. People won't, you know what I mean? So, you know, the only way I could have done that was in doing a solo release. But while it may have contributed to the split, the bigger reason why the group went their different ways was actually because of the relationships between members, more specifically, between White Clef and Lauren Hill. After spending a lot of time together, the duo started to develop feelings for each other and not long after, they even got into a romantic relationship. No, for real though, <laughs> on the real, I seen a mermaid though. Oh, don't go into this story, we just L, told L, us this story L, the other day. L. See, our yo, listen, music touch everybody, I right, listen, Mermaids, right? Listen, fish. I'm gonna tell you this story. Cause yo, I'm from Haiti. Now mind you, you know, you left Haiti when he was seven years old, right? No, no, I didn't leave when I was Okay, seven. how old were you? I was eight. Okay, my bad. I'm sorry. Eight. Okay, so when you're eight years old, you know, like, you remember things. Like, I remember my grandmother's house being 20 times bigger than it was. But go ahead. Yo, we was in the backyard, you know, and then where we lived, they had the beach. You know what I'm saying? In the back. 
And then I was just sitting, because I was always a kid that was just weird, you know? <laughs> so I was just to myself in the back, just kicking up. And, and then I seen this lady, you know? And then I just seen the face, so I thought it was somebody, like, in the water, like, you know, like, swimming. swimming. Yeah. And she was like, hey. She was like, hey, little boy. No, hey, little fella. That's what she said. No, but I'm saying boy, fella, it's the same thing. Don't play me <laughs> That's out. Just, I'm just she, trying she to get it. She said it word. in Creole. I'm just trying to get a word for word. If I said in Creole, y'all ain't going to understand. All right, so man, she didn't say hey, little fella. She was fella. a Haitian mermaid. She was a Haitian <laughs> mermaid. Yo, why are you playing me out? I'm saying. I ain't you, telling the story. No, I'm yo, tell I'm the story. Come on, man. I'm just playing. Go yo, ahead. I'm done, man. Tell a story. Nah, man. You just played me out. The Haitian no, mermaid. No, I just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> Like, it's important yo, that we put that. That's a piece I'm of done, information yo, that done, needs to man. be in the story. Go ahead. And you know what? If if this mermaid is watching this, <laughs> I want you to come get her, yo. <laughs> Don't go to the sea, yo. Pranz, the other member of the Fujis, had no idea about the relationship at first, and before it even happened, he cautioned White Love, who is his cousin, to try and stay away from romantic relationships within the group, as it could get messy. You know, and if you go back to the old article, articles one time you know where Proz was like yo man Clef was the cancer of the Fuji's you know wow. what I'm saying remember when he wow. said that because it, it at the time you got to understand his frustration though you feel me it was more like yo you know like you know I really wanted this thing to work and you know like you shouldn't have messed with the girl matter of fact didn't I warn you about messing with the girl but as fast as the feelings ignited the same way problems arose at the time, Wyclef was already in a relationship with another woman, whom he proceeded to marry shortly afterward. Despite his new marital life, Lauren and Wyclef continued to be a unit, but they enrolling themselves in a love triangle that sooner or later was bound to be doomed. Miss Hill felt like it wasn't fair that Wyclef had another woman, so she also started dating, and in the summer of 1996, Lauren met Rohan Marley, a son of Bob Marley and a former University of Miami, football player. They soon began dating and forming a relationship together, all while Hill was still romantically involved with White Love. To say that their relationship was messy would probably be an understatement. This crazy love train continued to become more complicated and in turn more toxic each day, all until one fateful day. During Thursday's recording session, Fuji Lauren Hill confirmed a rumor that had been running rampant through the Grammys on Wednesday. Are you with child? <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't blush on me now. Um, actually, yes, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. This is something that was planned, and are you excited about it? And planned in the sense of, um, you know, I'm 21 years old and going around the world. No, but planned in the sense that, um, you know, I'm very much in love and, and very happy. I mean, I see birth as um, motherhood as a benediction. So I'm just blessed with another responsibility. The confusion about who was the father of Miss Hill's child was the final nail in the coffin. White Clef believed that the kid was his, but in reality, the father of the child was Rohan Marley. There was nothing in my mind to, to lead me to not believing that that child was yours. That it was not mine. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. Do a man show up in the hospital like, um, no matter what she is to say. Mm -hmm. Why was I the one in the hospital and not Ro? Mm -hmm. So. Oof. Mm -hmm. While the pregnancy was the beginning of something new, it was also the end of something contemporary. The relationship between Wycliffe and Lauren Hill, to no surprise, became non-existent. And shortly afterward, they couldn't even stay in one room, let alone in the same group. During her pregnancy, Hill was working on her solo studio album since she felt more inspired than ever to write music. When some women are pregnant, their hair and their nails grow. But for me, it was my mind and ability to create. I had the desire to write in a capacity that I hadn't done in a while. Apart from working on her own album, Miss Hill worked with multiple artists, helping them to write songs. To be honest with you, the miseducation, the entire album started out um, as me, you know, producing and writing music for other acts. Um, you know, I had all these songs that I had planned to give away, you know, to other people till I realized, wow, this is about me and this is real personal and it's about my life. Maybe I better not give this stuff away. It's a little too personal. 
After many long studio sessions, in 1998, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill hit the shelves all around the world. The album broke many records, from becoming one of the best-selling albums of all time, selling over 12 million copies, to holding the record for the longest charting debut album by a female rapper for more than 21 years, and everything in between. If after the success of the score, Lauren was everywhere in the media, this took her stardom to a whole different level. The album was praised by many of the critics, praising Hill's presentation of a female's view on life and love, with Eric Weisberg from Spin calling her a genre bender whose confident singing and rapping was bounced by vulnerable themes and sentiment. Many of the album's songs drew inspiration from the turbulence in the Fugees as well as past love experiences. Challenge, you know what I mean, doing this solo joint, but it was something that I felt was necessary. Um, I didn't wake up one morning and decide, yo, I'm about to do a solo album. It, was, it wasn't like that. It was more like, um, uh, it was more like um, the music came. The music came first, and um, and before I knew, I had all these songs and and, and this and this this direction and this sound that I really wanted to communicate to the world. And um, the best way for me to do it was to do it solo because it was extremely personal you know it was extremely personal um and real special to me and, and a lot of it i didn't think would really fit into a fuji format so at that point i knew it was time the miseducation of lauren hill was nominated 10 times for the 1999 grammy awards making her the first woman to ever be nominated that many times in one year she won five grammys and also won the grammy award for the album of the year and the album of the year is The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill. <laughs> to say that Lauren Hill was at the top of the mountain would hardly do her justice. She not only delivered with her solo album, becoming one of the most recognizable people in the music industry, but also catapulted her career to legendary status, proving everyone who didn't support her from day one wrong. For the next couple of years, Lauren Hill continued to collect her awards for the album, appeared on multiple TV shows, started writing a screenplay about the life of Bob Marley, and was enjoying being a mother. Um, first of all, I don't think that you could have a child and not have your entire world change completely. Um, you know, my life is totally different from what it was when I was, you know, 20, 21 years old, you know, on the road by myself, you know, without a family to think about. Um, it humbles you, but at the same time, it gives you the greatest confidence in the world. While the fans were already starting to question her future music career, it didn't seem to concern her at all. From a glance, it seemed like life was going more than great for Miss Hill, but unfortunately, where there is light, there's always darkness, and Lauren was no exception. The beginning of the chain effect that would continue to ruffle Hill's life started in November 1998. The band by the name of New Ark filed a 50-page lawsuit against Lauren Hill, her management, and record label, claiming that she used their songs and production skills but failed to properly credit them for the work on Miseducation. They claimed to be the primary songwriters on two tracks and major contributors on several others. At the same time, Gordon Williams, a prominent recorder, engineer, and mixer on Miseducation, described the album as a powerfully personal effort by Hill and said it was definitely her vision. Lauren disagreed with the claims and responded that New Ark had been properly credited and now were seeking to take advantage of her success. The label that she was signed at the time, Columbia, urged her to settle, but Miss Hill wanted to fight. Her friend later commented, she felt like settling would have been an admission of guilt. She didn't want to be just a pretty face and a pretty voice. She wanted people to know she knows what she's doing. But the motion to fight meant that Miss Hill had to go into depositions and discuss making her art with lawyers. For the next three years, Lauren continued to fight in court, which not only drained her mentally and emotionally, but on top of all of that, she had to settle the suit out of court. It was reported that the four producers were paid $5 million. The money wasn't the hardest part to give up. It was the defeat, knowing that she lost the case after getting drained mentally for the past three years. The only problem was, she was one of the most public people at the time, and all eyes were pointed at her. 
If many of us could hit a reset button or just get our minds empty for a few days, this wasn't the case for Lauren. She was a working mother of two who had to support not only her children, but all of her family who were working with or for her, be a role model to the youth, and answer all the questions to the media, which at that time were starting to be more and more the same. When is your next album? You know, it does exist. Everyone, you know, I see people, hey, when's that record company you coming? You know, you can't leave us hanging like that. We need something else. Or the record company, you know, the, the, the window of opportunity is almost closed. But I just don't think that those rules apply to me. And not because of me, but I just think that it's something spiritual and something bigger. And I think that um, if you respond to the needs of the people, you know, that, that, that's timeless. You know, I, I never want to condescend. There are a lot of people who condescend to the audience. You know, they, they just think, oh, they like anything. Just throw a beat on it and put your voice on it. But if it doesn't move me, then I don't think it's worthy enough to put out there and move someone else. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 it has to be something that is, is, is personally, you know, is, is, is something that I need personally. That's my barometer for whether or not it's good for the people, not just anything, just, you know, just make a beat, it's hot, throw it out there, you know, that, that I can't use that barometer, that, that doesn't work with me. This kind of pressure, when your whole family depends on you for their well-being and all the people outside of your home expect you to talk about your follow-up album, could be a lot to many. She felt betrayed by the musician she thought of as family and thus was increasingly mistrustful of people in general. Her friend later commented, it was tough for her to admit all that to someone, so I think she spoke to the God. And maybe it wasn't God, but somebody showed up. That somebody was a religious figure named Brother Anthony. During this point of time, Lauren Hill was spiritually at the lowest point of her life, desperate to find somebody who could feel and understand her. Within three months of meeting Brother Anthony, the two became inseparable, with Hill going to Bible study with him two or three times a week and even began starting many of her sentences with the words, Brother Anthony says. As long as I remember that the glory is his and not my own, when I confuse that, I get in trouble. But when I remember the proper hierarchy, because see, see, we have it all wrong. We think that we glorify ourselves and that we, you know, the object is to glorify God first. And in doing that, you become glorified. You get glorified. You know, there are certain times when of late especially that God has shown me, you know, just be quiet. It's hard to say whether it helped her in retrospect, but at the time, Miss Hill herself was praising Brother Anthony any chance she got. I met someone who has an understanding of the Bible like no one else I've ever met in my life. I just sat at his feet and ingested pure scripture for about a year. Media, a lot of her close friends, and even Praz were more skeptical of this whole thing. In a 2003 interview with Rolling Stone, a friend of Miss Hill shared her views on Brother Anthony. His whole demeanor was real possessive, aggressive, and crooked to me. Pras also commented on that matter. Brother Anthony was definitely on some other sh I had a tip of his teachings that sh as well. me up. I can't really explain it. It was some weird sh It was some real cult. He was saying, give up all your money. To only add to the mystery, nobody was certain what church was Brother Anthony from, and if even he belonged to any religion in the first place, with many speculating of him being a cult leader. It was like she was being brainwashed by this man, believing everything he was saying and telling her what to do. These speculations of him being a cult leader weren't created out of thin air, because not long after, Missile started to act real strange, to say the least. Throughout the next decade, fans all over the world were in hopes of one day hearing the new Lauren Hill project, but unfortunately, as we all know, it never happened. And what seemed like a career that would continue to flourish as the years went by, suddenly started to take a different turn. At the beginning of the 2000s, Lauren Hill started to drop every single one of her acting roles and screenplays that she was working. While she stopped working on Bob Marley's documentary, producing a romantic comedy sauce, and a role in a film adaptation of Tommy Marsan's novel, Beloved, due to her pregnancy, it didn't stop there. After the birth of her second child, everyone expected Miss Hill to get back into the movie scene and continue working on many of her projects. Unfortunately, 
the opposite happened, as she not only forgot about her previous works, but started turning down every single one of her acting roles, which included many successful films like A Star is Born, Dreamgirls, Charlie's Angels, The Born Identity, The Mexican, The Matrix Reloaded, and The Matrix Revolutions. Furthermore, she fired her management team, began attending Bible study classes five times a week, stopped doing interviews, watching television, listening to music, and completely disappeared from the public eye. To see this kind of behavior was nothing short of unusual, and many believed that brother Anthony had something to do with it. After all, he was one of the sketchiest guys around her for almost 24 hours a day, seven times a week. Miss Hill's behavior didn't end there, as in July of 2001, while being pregnant with her third child, she unveiled her new material performing live to a small crowd for a taping of an MTV Unplugged special. The day before her performance, Hill ripped up her throat and refused to reschedule, therefore, her voice on the record was raspy and ragged. She accompanied herself on guitar, the lone instrument on the album, which was courageous given that she hadn't been studying very long. In fact, after this performance was released as a live album, called MTV Unplugged 2.0, many of the critics did mention her lack of skill as one of the downsides of the album by saying that anyone with ears can hear that there are only three chords being played on every song. The live album sold only 470,000 copies, which compared to her studio album, were rookie numbers, marking the record as a failure. Despite low record sales, people still did enjoy the album. Critics, on the other hand, were a whole different story. A lot of them were saying the same thing. The album feels unfinished, and while many didn't shy away from calling it fascinating, more and more insiders were agreeing with the idea that if this was a lesser known artist, it would have never been released. Enemy wrote, Unplugged 2.0 is a sparse and often grueling listen, but there is enough genius shading these rough sketches to suggest that all might not yet be lost. This wouldn't be the last time we would hear criticism towards Lauren Hill for being unprofessional and was slowly but surely becoming one of the main ones. In 2002, Lauren announced that she was closing her non-profit organization called The Refugee Project, which was designed to help the underprivileged. Her mother Valerie was president and the charity ran a summer camp for impoverished kids and donated money all around the world. When asked about the reasoning, she told MTV, I had a non-profit organization and I had to shut all that down. You know, smiling with big checks, obligatory things, not having things come from a place of fashion, that's slavery. Everything we do should be a result of our gratitude for what God has done for us. It should be passionate. A year later, she also divorced her husband, Rohan, whom she was never married to, and moved out to live separately, with Hill getting her own place in Miami. In her new apartment, she decided to install a recording studio, and what wouldn't seem strange, as a lot of musicians have their own studio in their houses, Lauren was doing all of this at the expense of the label. After the live album release, which made Columbia Records lose a lot of money due to low record sales and high funding, Hill promised them that she was working on her second studio album, which they thought was going to be another huge success. By 2003, it was reported that Columbia Records had spent more than $2.5 million funding her much-anticipated album by not only installing a recording studio, but also by flying different musicians around the country. Still, there was no sign of a new album. In December of 2003, Hill made a first performance in years, appearing in Vatican City, where she once again became a huge talking point. During her set, she was handed a microphone to perform, when all of a sudden, she started going off on the corruption, exploitation, and abuses in reference to the sexual assault of boys by Catholic priests in the United States and the cover-up of offenses by Catholic Church officials. She said, I didn't come here to celebrate the birth of Christ with you, but to ask you why you are not in mourning for his death inside this place. She continued by saying, God has been a witness to the corruption of his leadership, to the exploitation and abuses. It is the least one can say about the clergy. High-ranking church officials that were in attendance were not moved, later calling Hill pathologically miserable and claiming that her career was in decline. Once again, Miss Hill was dragged in the mud by the media, with many suggesting that Hill's comments were influenced by her spiritual advisor, Brother Anthony. In 2005, after almost 10 years, the Fujis decided to reunite and embark on a European tour in late 2005. Unfortunately, 
The comeback didn't last long, as all tensions between Hill and the other members of the group resurfaced. Hill reportedly demanded to be addressed by everyone, including her bandmates, as Miss Hill, and was also considering changing her moniker to Empress. Hill's actions were cited as one of the main factors contributing to the breakup. She came back to the United States as a solo artist and decided to begin touring on her own. This would once again reignite the claims of Lauren Hill being unprofessional. Many of the reviews from her tour often had the same criticisms. She would often arrive late to the concerts, sometimes by over two hours, performing unpopular reconfigurations of her songs and sporting an exaggerated appearance. On some occasions, fans would start to boo her and even resorted to leaving the shows early. A couple of years later, in April of 2009, she would once again engage in a 10-day tour of European summer festivals during mid-July of that year. Hill performed two shows for the tour until she passed out on stage during the start of her second performance and decided to leave. She refused to provide refunds for angry consumers and would shortly afterward cancel the rest of the tour due to health reasons. For years now, Lauren Hill's name was dragged in the mud all across the media, often accompanied by a hefty amount of criticism, and in February 2012, the media got a lot of new titles to print. Some trouble for Lauren Hill. It's really, Indeed. it's a shame. Uh, the Grammy Award winning singer now reporting to prison on July 8th to begin serving sentence for failure to pay her federal income taxes for three years. Lauren Hill was charged with three counts of tax fraud or failing to file taxes on $1.8 million of income earned between 2005 and 2007. In a long post to her Tumblr, Hill said that she had gone underground and had rejected pop culture's climate of hostility, false entitlement, manipulation, racial prejudice, sexism, and ageism. When I was working consistently without being affected by the interferences mentioned above, I filed and paid my taxes. This only stopped when it was necessary to withdraw from society in order to guarantee the safety and well-being of myself and my family. At this point, it's been almost 14 years since the release of The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, and while the album was celebrated by many and considered to be one of the most influential hip-hop albums of all time, it was clear that amidst her personal battles, this was the first and the last album that we will ever hear from Miss Hill again. The only lingering question to many was, what happened? What made a woman who was an example to many black American youths start acting erratically out of nowhere? While it's hard to pinpoint which situation specifically made her act out, whether it was the breakup of the Fugees, the unfair love triangle with White Love, relationship problems with her husband Rohan, problems with the label, or even the fear of not living up to the hype, I think there's one narrative that often gets left out, and it's Lauren Hill herself. My young life was sort of, you know, it was a period of time I wasn't allowed to be young, and now I'm sort of getting back into youth again. It's very responsible, you know? You know, and part of me fears acknowledging, like, yo, you know, what, what do I enjoy? Back in 1996, Lauren Hill became the face of one of the biggest groups of all time, and while it came with a lot of positives, the negatives seemed to outweigh the latter. My whole life at, at, the, at a certain point was studio and, and uh, you know, uh, studio, hotel, stage, hotel, stage, studio, stage, hotel, studio, stage, you know. With the popularity boost from the miseducation, Lorna Hill quickly found herself not only lost spiritually, but she understood that she had become a person she never intended to be. And on top of all of that, while it was already too late, the limelight wasn't something she enjoyed. There was a lot, a lot, lot that happened. You know, a lot took place. A lot took place after the, after the first album. Um, you know, when you're young and you get an enormous amount of attention, you know, at certain just sort of world dynamics and you know, the politics of situations, you just have to be very, very headstrong very prayed up, very protected, because um, there's often a lot of, um, there's a lot that could force an individual to compromise. I returned to a normal situation with my children running around, screaming, <laughs> you know, and, and it was wonderful. And I walked down the street and I went grocery shopping 
and I loved it. Every minute of it I love. I find, you know, even when it's raining, I just go outside, I look outside, and I, I'm just so blessed to see it and to experience it because for such a long time I was just indoors. I wanted a real life as well, you know, out of public scrutiny. I wanted to be able to live, you know, um, to reclaim my private life, to reclaim my individuality, you know, outside of, um, you know, sort of mass media scrutiny. I, want, I wanted that freedom. You know, I think that people react to money, power, fame differently. And uh, it can be very dangerous. And for me, because my peace of mind, my sanctity, you know, what I did, what I, the things that I did, they came from a very spiritual place. So my environment had to be even more pure and sanctified than the average person's. You know, which, when you're sort of in lion's den, you know, seems extreme. It's like, well, why do you have to do things that way? And, you know, and you, you appear difficult, but they don't necessarily realize that you're difficult because A, what you do is difficult, you know, and B, in order to produce something that's really special, you know, it requires a very serious environment. She had to find a plan to finally get back to her senses, and for her, it was brother Anthony. In a 2003 interview with Rolling Stone magazine, one of her friends said, I think maybe for a long time, she thought she knew what she wanted, but in reality, she didn't. She's gonna come through it, but she doesn't think anything is wrong with her. She used brother Anthony to get rid of the stuff in her life that she didn't want to struggle with. It's hard to say whether she did it consciously or not, but one thing was certain. She didn't like her lifestyle and wanted all the problems that she was facing at the time from being too popular to just disappear. Apart from her privacy being removed, she was very verbal about the fact that she was groomed by the industry, who continued to silence her all throughout the years, all because she didn't want to play by the rules and wanted to be a real conscious artist instead of becoming another part of the machine. Many of her struggles were also voiced on MTV Unplugged 2.0 album with songs like I Get Out, speaking about how the industry did her wrong and how she wasn't going to continue to bow down. To her, it seemed like she could use brother Anthony as her only way out. The only downside was that she was too deep in. She used them to her advantage, then she went too far, and she doesn't know how to come back. 